Today on Tech Tuesday, we're getting nerdy about electrons. We're gonna look at why if you don't size a wire correctly, it gets hot and potentially lets the smoke out. We'll go through the governing rules that dictate how much current a circuit is going to draw. And finally, we're gonna look at why sometimes things just don't add up to what you expect. All right, let's go. Before we even get into the weeds on volts, amps and resistance and how they're all related to one another, it's worth just stepping back for a moment and looking at some of the basic types of electrical circuits that we'll deal with in an automotive system. So within the engine bay and from an engine control perspective, there's two major types of circuits that we deal with. Sensors, which relay information into the control system and actuators that are being controlled by the control system, either an ECU or a PDM. So actuators is just the technical name for the things in the engine bay that actually do something. Things like fuel injectors, ignition coils, fans, pumps, solenoids, and that sort of thing. These are the components that the control system are actually turning on and off to make something happen in the physical world. And today's discussion of circuits is going to concentrate mainly on these actuators, because frankly, these are the things that have the highest potential for stuff to go wrong with. So for example, if you size the wiring to the fuel pump inadequately, you might end up creating enough heat that the wiring turns a small electrical problem into a very serious fuel fire. So let's take a deeper look into this phenomenon of the wiring getting hot. And we'll use the simplest example I can think of, which is simply turning on and off a regular old light bulb, like this one here that I stole from the indicator of my daily driver. Now, as you can see, this is a really simple device. You apply power to the bottom and ground to the body of the globe and the light turns on. The question is, why is getting the gauge or the thickness of the wire important for an electrical circuit though? And to answer that question, we need to get a little bit nerdy because the gauge of the wire required is proportional to the amount of current that the circuit is drawing. And current being drawn by the circuit is proportional to the resistance of the thing it's controlling. And this is where our old friend George Ohm steps in with Ohm's law. You see, Ohm's law is what we use to relate current, voltage, and resistance. And Ohm's law states that voltage equals current times resistance, or V equals IR. So what does that mean for powering up our light globe, or a fuel pump, or a nitrous solenoid, or any other device that you may have in your engine bay or your entire vehicle. Well, traditionally, we are using a 12 volt electrical system, or when the engine's running, maybe it's 13.8 volts because that's what the alternator is regulating the voltage to. In the real world, you could be at 14.2 volts, 14.4, even 16 volts, depending on your particular application. If you're not sure, then just grab a multimeter, set it to DC voltage, and measure the voltage across your battery with the engine running. For today though, we're just gonna stick with 13.8 volts. That's the most common. According to Ohm's law, which is voltage equals current times resistance, if we know our voltage is 13.8 volts, then all we have to do is measure the resistance of the device that we're trying to run to calculate the amount of current that that device will draw. So let's check it out. Putting my here multimeter, into resistance mode and measuring the resistance of this light globe, I've got about one ohm worth of resistance. Now to calculate the current draw, I'll take the 13.8 volts and I'll divide it by the one ohms and this light should draw 13.8 amps roughly worth of current. Now this is the same calculation that you would use when you're driving any device in the engine bay, whether that be a fuel injector, a nitrous solenoid, a thermofan or anything else you can think to control. Now we know the theoretical amount of current that this light globe should draw, we can go about sizing up not only the wiring, but also ensuring that we select an appropriate set of connectors and plugs and pins that you're going to use for each device. So you don't want to be using one of these little Deutsch DTM pins and connectors to try and run a Bosch 044 fuel pump at 40 PSI boost because I can tell you from seeing it enough times, this will let the smoke out of your nice Deutsch DTM connector. Now, the simplest and most practical way of sizing your wiring appropriately when you know how much current the system's gonna draw is really just to use Google. 
do a quick search on the internet and there's a bunch of accurate calculators that'll ask you to input the voltage, the current and the length of wire. That's gonna spit out for you a minimum wire gauge for your application. These are pretty good calculators, but I guess there's one more question that I've got to ask myself here, and that is why? I mean, why do I need a thicker gauge wire to carry more current? And of course, anyone who's used a wire that's too small for the intended application knows that too thin a wire gets really, really hot. But why? I always ask myself the question, why? I mean, I absolutely could run that Bosch 044 fuel pump with a 24 gauge wire. Now, for those of you who don't know, 24 gauge is quite a thin wire. I could do that for a little while anyway. The question is, why does this heat get generated in a thin wire, but not necessarily in a thicker wire? And the answer to that one gets even nerdier, you see. It all goes down, all the way down, to the subatomic level of electrons passing down the copper wire from one molecule of copper to the next molecule of copper in that length of wire you've got. You see, amps, or current flow, is a measure of the actual number of electrons that are being moved through your circuit. So now imagine two scenarios with the same current draw. Um, so that's the same number of electrons need to spill out the end of your wire over time. But in one case, you've got a really thin wire. And in the other case, you've got a very thick wire. Now the speed at which the electrons need to be transported down the wire is much higher in that thin wire than the thicker wire. Sounds confusing, right? Because the same total amount of current's being drawn in both scenarios, but the thin wire, it gets hot. So let's just change the way we're looking at this from electrons in a wire to say, water in two different hoses. We've got our first hose, which is your regular garden hose. It's quite thin. That's your thin wire. Then we've got the second wire, which is a much thicker hose. Maybe it's a fire hose. Better yet, it's one of those giant water pipes that supplies the whole town. Now, we wanna get a fixed number of electrons out of the end of the wire. Or in this case, it's a fixed volume of water that comes out of the tap at the end. And what we wanna measure is the speed at which the water is moving through the hose. Now it's clear from this illustration that the speed at which the water moves along the hose is going to be directly proportional to the diameter of the hose that it's moving through. This example is exactly the same as electrons moving through a wire. The electrons need to move much faster through a thinner wire to provide the same amount of volume of electrons out the other side. But why does it matter? Well, the faster that the electrons have to move down the wire, the more heat that gets generated in the wire itself. So when you ask a very, very thin wire to transport a high volume of electrons along it, then it can do it, but it generates heat. And depending on how much current you ask for and how long you ask for it, that heat can get too much for the wire covering. And that is where you let the smoke out. And once the smoke is out, there's no putting it back in. So now we've got an understanding of how to calculate from Ohm's law, how much current a device will draw. We actually understand now why pulling too much current through an undersized wire can cause it to heat up. Let's look in practice how a real electrical circuit reacts. And to illustrate this, we're gonna go back to the light globe and we're gonna use a bench power supply here. It's got a built-in current meter. So on this unit, I can actually set the supply voltage to any number of voltages, but I'm gonna use 13.8 volts and we're gonna be able to measure the actual amount of current being drawn by the whole circuit, which is just gonna be a light load. And for those of you still watching, this is exactly the type of measurement that Haltech PD16 PDM can give you as well, both in real time as you're viewing it in the software or as log data that you can go around the track, do a few laps and then come back and review later. All right, so getting back to our light globe. We'll measure the current, the ohms across the light globe. In this case, there's about one ohm worth of resistance and according to Ohm's law, that should draw at 13.8 volts, about 13.8 amps worth of current. So let's check that out. Well, that's embarrassing. Did I just break Ohm's law, like the fundamental law of electronics that has been relied upon for the last 200 years to design everything electrical you've ever seen? Of course not. You see, the light globe, that little wire in there, there's nothing at all special about it. In fact, 
It's just a very, very, very thin piece of wire inside the light globe. And when I put power and ground across it, for the first moment, it actually would draw about 13.8 amps worth of current. And those electrons, they do get drawn through the wire at lightning speed. So much so that the element or filament in this light globe gets very, very hot. So hot, in fact, that it glows. You see, a light globe like this is the perfect example of where we actually leverage the fact that when you draw enough current through a thin wire, it'll heat up. The difference here is we use this to our advantage in a light globe. We intentionally want to get that wire red hot so that it provides us with light. What about the current draw? Why did the power supply say that the current draw was so much lower than what we had calculated it should be? Well, you see, that's the other thing about heat. When we generate it in the wire, the hotter the wire gets, the more resistance builds up. So as we turn the light on, the globe itself draws a lot of current. But as it heats up and starts to glow, well, the resistance in the filament goes up as well, and therefore the actual current requirement for the globe goes down. And that's why we only saw a couple of amps on the meter. So let's have a recap. Using Ohm's law, we can calculate the expected maximum current draw on any circuit. Armed with this information, we can appropriately size the wiring to high current devices. We also know why and how things go pear-shaped when you undersize the wiring. Now we also introduce the idea that just measuring the resistance of a component may not always tell us the full story about the amount of current the device is going to draw in a real world application. See things like fuel injectors and ignition coils, they're switched on and off at really high frequency. So while you may measure the individual component resistance and calculate the current draw, the total current draw over time for the fuel system or the ignition system varies significantly with things like RPM and engine load, because obviously the injector is open for longer as manifold pressure goes up. So the real world practical application of Ohm's law actually requires a little more thought than first anticipated because it's nuanced. The good news is devices like the Haltech PD16 that can give you real time measurements of the actual current being drawn by a circuit and give you the ability to either shut a circuit down or perhaps leave it active for a predetermined period of time gives you, the end user, full control and diagnostics over your entire vehicle's electrical system. Now, I know that was a really nerdy and wordy Tech Tuesday video. So when answering this week's viewer question, I'll make it a simple one. JDM Frick, which I think is JDM Freak with no valves, asks, I'm doing an RB swap into my air chassis. What would you recommend? One of your plug-in ECUs or a fully terminated harness? Well, JDM Frick. Uh, for that one, I'm gonna go along with the ECU and terminated harness option. This is gonna give you a brand new wiring harness rather than taking a used Skyline harness and then moving all the parts that you don't need and then still being left with a 20 or 30 year old harness that's been hacked apart, you're gonna get a brand new Howtech delivered fully terminated harness. Plus your air chassis doesn't have any of the other subsystems that might be in existence within the Skyline itself. And so it's probably a better application and it really doesn't matter whether that's an S chassis or you're putting it into an MG or you're putting that into an old data or whatever it might be. My answer to this one is actually fairly consistent across the board with the whole patch harness versus terminated harness question. If you are using an RB engine and it's still in a Skyline, then I would go with the Skyline plugin. But if you're taking that RB engine and you're shoehorning it into any other chassis, then you go with the terminated harness with an Elite ECU option. Well, hopefully that answers your question, JDM Frick. That's all we have time for on today's Tech Tuesday. Don't forget to ring the bell, subscribe to the newsletter, or if you want to disagree with anything I've said, it's YouTube, put it in the comments down below. I'm Matt from Haltech, and I'll see you next Tech Tuesday. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, smash that like button. We put out a new video every week, and sometimes even two. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more awesome content.